My name is Pavel Filipov, and next to me is Fedor Konstantinov. We are meeting with you for our Friday webinar, where we talk about the news of the Airships of the New Generation project and answer your questions. So feel free to write your questions now. We will definitely get to them. We sincerely apologize for missing the extremely important webinar on Tuesday, where we were supposed to present the project. Well, today we will tell you what we have been busy with and why we couldn't attend the webinar. As you can see, it was already clear from the title that today's webinar is quite unusual because we are conducting it from the office of the company Novi, which will be engaged in the construction and operation of airships of the new generation, and our team is already starting to form here. We will talk about all of this. Before we begin, don't forget about your important engagement. Remember the magic of social media. The more likes you give, and the more shares you make, the more viewers there will be for these broadcasts. And I would like to remind you that our main broadcasts are on vContact, and on YouTube, on the Airships of the New Generation channel, on the official YouTube channel. But remember, with YouTube, anything can happen at any moment. So don't forget to subscribe to all our social media channels to stay updated on the news. In the description of this broadcast, you can find the Telegram channel, vContact, and other social networks. Subscribe everywhere. And don't forget, as I mentioned earlier, about the planned activity. So, well, uh, let's get started. Let's start with the numbers, as already mentioned. What do we have in terms of numbers? At the moment, we have over 1,700 investors in the project, even more. These are the people who have actually invested in the project. A big thank you for your help with the project, for indeed joining it at this current pre-launch stage, when much is still unclear, and in fact, the foundation of this project is truly being formed right before your eyes. As for the investments themselves, it's 625 students. At this point, a total of thousands of dollars have already been effectively invested, which means that this is the money that people have used to purchase investment packages. Today, we have 1,800 such investment packages that people have already acquired. So as you can see, some individuals already hold multiple investment packages, which is also wonderful. Speaking about the commitments that people have taken on, since investments can be made in installments, it amounts to 5.5 million, slightly less. This is the money that will come to the project one way or another, but it is stretched over time for three and even up to 50 months as installments are currently available. So. A very big thank you to you for your great support, which has allowed the project to actively gain momentum. This new office, which we now have, is the place where the new employees, designers, and others will work, and it's all thanks to you. This is the first result that we can already see. But in reality, a lot of work is being done right now, and there will be many other things that you will see very soon here. Fedor, I want to ask you, tell me about this office in general. What is here? What will be happening in the near future? And what news is there overall? Yes, there are a lot of news. Hello, everyone. There is so much work that I don't even have time to structure the news before the webinar. So as always, it's off the cuff, straight from the heart. Yes, we are in the office and have already completed our first week. We already received the keys on Monday. We have currently started to call in the performers and the process of signing the first employment contracts is already underway. By the way, the first employment contract was signed with the Director of Administrative and Economic Activities for this premises because it is very important to establish it here now. There are also a bunch of various contracts and other things, but to avoid dealing with that, there is a separate person who helps us, which is really great. Thank you very much to Vladimir. As for the office, we have 500 square meters here. And all the offices are already assigned. The technology department will be located there. Here is a large conference room that you can't see. Over here, the offices are occupied by lawyers, finance specialists, and accountants. At the end, the director of occupational health and safety is sitting. The Deputy General Director for Corporate Activities, who is responsible for overseeing, will be sitting over there. 
Here in front of us is the office which has been taken right by Sergei Semyonov and his team. Over there, straight ahead where I'm looking right now, there's a large room where the designers and technologists are still sitting. What time is it? Friday, October 17th. They aren't even planning to go home. They are discussing the project and its details. Ruslan is currently there, and he is responsible for production and technology. How everything will be done, where it will all take place, to ensure that everything is fast, cheap, and of super quality. And Boris Alexandrovich, who was with us last Friday. Boris Alexandrovich has indeed been the director of the design bureau both in the past and in the present. The director of the design bureau is not a designer. He is the administrator who organizes all the work. They are definitely agreeing on how everything will absolutely be, because it is essential to coordinate the work of the design bureau with production. In general, everyone understands everything. They are planning to go out. Have you worked enough? We are already holding the webinar, which is very informative and engaging. If you want, come over and join us for an insightful session. All the best. Yes, regarding Tuesday. On Tuesday, the reason we didn't actually go live is that we had an important large meeting here. We have already started working, as I mentioned to you, and there have been intense debates regarding the stratospheric apparatus, specifically about the technical specifications for the stratosphere, what it will do there, and what useful payloads it will carry. Very, very in general. As they say, if it's terrible, then the result is unknown. In general, we worked in this direction. And the next direction, generally speaking, we have finished on it. Everything is clear there. So, what is understood approximately? When is it planned to take to the skies and what is the purpose of this? What exactly is this project in the context of the new? Look, we talked about the fact that in the future there will indeed be stratospheric heavy platforms of airship type. They are highly promising, extremely economical, and just super well-founded and trustworthy. But it is impossible to build a large apparatus right away. In other words, the steps must start with small, well, with minor apparatuses. And there are certain scientific studies that need to be conducted. They do not have to be conducted on stratospheric airships. It is possible to create a long-lasting, long-lived device. And as part of it, to conduct scientific work, they are related to airflows, similar to the different winds we have on the planet at various altitudes. There is, of course, big data, and there are mathematical models. Based on this big data, there is reality. And we need to consolidate all of this into one direction, which means studying the winds, looking at which heights and seasons correspond to which winds, and how this aligns with mathematical models. Refining the mathematical models is a long process, and it is already starting. On one hand, there is the testing of equipment, meaning what equipment we will use for communication with this apparatus. On the other hand, this apparatus must perform a useful function, for example, acting as a relay. There are completely different conditions, such as a rarefied atmosphere and very low temperatures, extremely low temperatures. All of this equipment that will eventually be used on these stratospheric platforms is already partially available. We even have something of our own development. We indeed have an engineering team and a scientific one. You might have seen in Kirshach, I introduced Denis Filipov there, Boroda and Artem. And I, well, in our free time from work, we engaged in creativity. And as it turned out, when we started discussing and diving into the airship theme, it became clear that the communication systems we had already developed just because we could are actually very expensive for someone else, while we have our own. So why do we need theirs? the same communication systems can be lifted into the air to see how they behave. Of course, there are simulation chambers, by the way. We have those in our laboratory as well. You can simply pump out the air there, set the desired temperature, 
and see how the equipment behaves. And for this, a very clear technical specification for the development of this program is needed, at least for the first year. This is exactly what we have been working on. As for the upcoming launches, they are being postponed. The deadlines are being pushed back, not because we cannot launch it, we can launch it right now, but because we are clarifying exactly what equipment and what testing program it needs to go through. The launches will be before the new year, and we will likely manage to do three of them right before the new year. There will be both quick launches, that are lasting a maximum of approximately four hours in duration, and multi-day launches lasting several days. All of this is essential. It has already started, actually, I confess. Indeed, we are not filming some moments. Work is underway on the preparation of both the analog communication system and the digital communication system. Starting Monday, we will begin creating content and posting updates on everything. Is progressing. We will show it all. In general, regarding the content, I think you didn't mention that there will be a studio here. No, I didn't mention it. Yes, a full-fledged studio is planned to be organized, and this will allow for much more content to be created. There will be many videos explaining the project itself, and about airships in general. Well, in general, everything that is needed, so to speak, for promotion and for informing all interested parties, so to speak. Additionally, one of the most important tasks right now is to find an operator for the team here in Novi. Just an operator who will always be nearby and who can film everything that happens here, upload videos, then there will be much more information. Yes, and partially we will move our laboratory here. First of all, we will have an operator on staff and content will flow in abundance. Some things we will film, some things we won't film because it's still in development. Yes. But when, Pavel, will the operator be? The search has definitely started right now. I can certainly say that. So what are we doing for a whole month? Wait. Active search. So, what? We were in an active search. In general, there are resumes, there are candidates, and now either we are proceeding with them, or the interviews will start soon. The studio was awaited foremost, now it seems like the office is also ready, so it looks like we can start doing all of this now. And so, it's clear about the studio. Here we will have a studio, where Ruslan's technology service will be located, and part of the laboratory will move there, so we will be soldering, and printing on printers here. I really consider hanging a camera over there. Allow there be a real-time broadcast. It's really quite entertaining. I would occasionally watch what they are doing there. Or I did something there, but I wouldn't watch it anymore. In general, it's a big deal. The volume of work that was done this week, and what is still to come, I will talk about, is related to the formation of the technical specifications and the technical appearance of the first device, which is not stratospheric, but rather airship-based, because there are many technical solutions and ideas about how it should actually be. And all of this should align with the project's financing. Moreover, we need to understand how much money has come in. We cannot immediately build a huge house on one hand, while on the other hand, we must create a breakthrough device that performs useful functions and demonstrates superiority over all others. And now the very solution has crystallized. Well, in terms of its technical appearance, parameters, characteristics and so on, which will be built and will take off within the first year of operation. And his technical specifications are also so detailed and all of this needs to be worked through, which will take us some time. And we will roll it out, and then create a very detailed presentation, thoroughly design its exterior, and showcase all of its specifications. I can say right away, it will be, as I mentioned before, a completely unmanned version, and it will automatically exit the hangar. By the way, the hangar will be classic for him. There is no need to build anything special. For it, any aviation hangar will suit him. I think on that Friday, yes, I talked about it. Well, you can yes, tell it again, because as I understand, there were also some clarifications this week. So, in general, we are talking about what the first airship from the new generation will be like, which is already quite clear, right? It's clear when it should take off, yes, in a year, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. 
and the amount of money needed for its creation isn't that much. I mean, it's not like... Hundreds of millions or even billions. That's how much we can mention as a figure right now. We have preliminarily estimated the entire project for its creation, which includes attracting external specialists and organizations, as well as the material capacity of the project, and testing. The entire turnkey project for the creation of this is preliminarily estimated at about 1.2 million, well, 1.1 million 200,000 dollars approximately. This is preliminary. We are calculating this entire economy, calculating, calculating, summarizing, but the price is already set, and this will be a single prototype, which will receive the designation Experimental 1, E1. It will have a certificate and will be tested at the Zhukovsky flight field. The preliminary estimate is already realistic. So, if earlier, when we looked at how much it would cost to build this device, we included the construction of the whaling and everything else, it was all very broad strokes, and the price was quite biting. Now the price is dropping significantly. And what is most interesting is that by localizing our production, we find that there are actually very clever airship builders there. And as you delve deeper and deeper into the industry, you realize that in fact, an airship can be built quite cheaply and relatively quickly. Once again, I mentioned last time that when the project started, people had the opinion that it was some kind of long-term construction. Airships are so complicated, it requires billions. I understand. I will take a look at what you have achieved in a couple of years. Not only will there be devices launched under the company's brand by the end of the year, but they are not yet airships and they already have some commercial and potential aspects. And the aircraft will be ready in a year for 120 million rubles, roughly, just like in a fantasy. Yes, of course, everything could be adjusted somehow. We will be watching and telling what the final cost will be. It's not a billion, right? As some might have thought. And this is the first experimental one. If, no, not if but by establishing its series with a sufficiently high percentage of localization specifically under Ruslan's guidance, I believe its serial price will significantly decrease. And this could actually be a shock even for the industry. It is, of course, in its infancy. But the airship enthusiasts have an unwritten rule that was established long, long ago. They are, how should I put it, in a cartel agreement. 1,000 cubic meters of the airship costs $1 million, that's it, and they just agreed on that while selling the airship. How many cubic meters do you need for the airship? Uh, 2,000. This is the little one that we will be building. So indeed the price is definitely at least approximately $2 million, and we understand that our experimental model is twice as cheap, and we can still reduce the cost of the serial model. It's even become a bit frightening. Fortunately, the airship market is still nearly at zero. And what is most pleasant is that we can reshape. Even the previous foundations. More precisely, there are people who will not thank us for that. For example, the Germans sell their devices for outrageous prices. Maybe the Airlander in the UK has some kind of price tag as well. There are some who are furious about it, but on the other hand, there are many more people who will say, thank you guys, this is a really cool tool. And finally, it has become accessible for an affordable price. This airship is the first. It might be possible to do it faster. Overall, the year is mainly about development time, not money. 120 million rubles can be attracted faster, ye. But maybe we can't design it faster. Or maybe we can still do it faster. Let's see. A year is neither an optimistic nor a pessimistic time frame. These are approximately the same timelines that this dedicated team once used in the past to meticulously design, develop, and build the innovative devices that we rely on today. So overall, yes, we would have managed it in a year, but there were issues with financing, organizational matters, and so on.
in general we were late and i was like how long two years no it's one year and three months and i thought well overall it's fine we were almost a year late so they say that a year is a normal construction time for the device considering that we don't need to build anything for it oh right so this size that has been chosen is also an interesting question it turns out that it is specifically built to a certain size so that it fits into a standard hangar, right? Not a hangar, but rather a standard aviation shed. There are many of these both in our country and in all other countries. There are gates that are 12 by 12 and he can easily go through them. This is the most optimal solution that they have finally come to, quickly. This airship is planned to operate in unmanned mode and autonomous with already commercial applicability and more. And for its applicability, we need to build a hangar for the client. Why? In each region, there are airports, airfields, and aerodromes where ready-made hangars are available. Starting from there, the aircraft can operate smoothly. Once again, we are building the first state in this way. On one hand, as a demonstrator to showcase, and on the other hand, to refine the technologies, these are our goals. Or will we still get some commercial sample that can perhaps potentially generate profit in the beginning? On it, well indeed, the demonstrator, as we called it internally, there are several branches of thought direction. Before that, we demonstrate that we are organized and capable. Yes, it is a demonstrator. However, in terms of its product properties, these are already complete products, ready for commercialization. There will be a slight time lag with its certification and licensing, slightly conditionally, a bit. But there, it is possible to mass produce them and finalize the documentation, and this can be done in parallel. Listen, can we already talk about some specific technologies that will be used? Maybe something unusual, revolutionary, or some problems that will be solved? I just heard something just now, but I don't really know if it's okay to talk about it at all. Well, I already mentioned the unmanned version, right? That it's unmanned, or how? Or will the first one still be manned, or what? It will most likely be optionally piloted. There are generally two approaches to making it unmanned. The first is when a completely unmanned vehicle is created from scratch. Then it will have to work a bit harder, or rather, it will be those who will be overseeing it that will have to work a bit harder. Alternatively, it could be an optionally piloted vehicle, where initially a test pilot initially sits in it, conditionally speaking. He understands all its mechanics, how it flies, its dynamics, and even more details. At the same time, the machine observes what the pilot is doing and under what conditions. In simple terms, it learns from the pilot. So there are these two paths, which one specifically speaking about the exact details of, more details about. Once we finalize the technical specifications for the device, we will determine which specific one to go with. Is it easier to proceed with the optionally piloted version? It's simpler. It would be more interesting to go with the fully autonomous and self-driving unmanned option. Which of these vehicles will be more commercially attractive in terms of marketability and consumer appeal, and why? A fully unmanned option will be more attractive in one area, while an optional piloted version will be appealing in a slightly different area. Most likely, um, well, I won't say anything for now. Once we finish the technical specifications, it will be clear. And when will the technical specifications be available? Will we be able to see them, or will it still be crawling and shouting? I think in my opinion we will naturally show some important key points that are absolutely essential and critical. The Scientific and Technical Council will definitely say, do not show this, this, and this. Show the rest. Everything that can be published, of course, we will publish. We have a typical audience based on comments is divided into two camps. Some say, tell us the details. Others say, no details, don't share anything, everyone will know, they will steal it, we will maintain a balance. Yes, it will definitely be somewhere probably in the middle. So, overall, it's great. It turns out there is an understanding regarding the launch of both the stratospheric vehicles and a detailed understanding of what the first airship from the new company will be like, when it will be ready, how much it will cost.
Everything has been discussed. It's fantastic. Very interesting details are emerging, in my opinion. Yes, and I think everyone would find it interesting to hear him. Is there anything else we have in terms of news? Maybe about the team? You mentioned that the first employees have been hired. Can we already name the designers who are definitely in the team? Well, the chief designer of this first type of device is indeed the very well-known and renowned designer named Vadim Zubkevich. The director of the design bureau. This is the important and key person who organizes all the administrative aspects, gathers everyone for the meeting, and inquires how things are going. This is Boris Alexandrovich Evchenko. This, roughly speaking, is first Boris Alexandrovich Evchenko, followed by the names of Vadim Zubkevich, approximately. These are the exact positions that are occupied yeah. in the company Nova, which is a leading and well-respected firm in its field. There are also a number of professionals who... In general, next week Boris Alexandrovich Ivchenko will show us the organizational structure and how he has arranged everyone else within this structure. So, we will take a look next week. In general? The two are those who are already fully on staff, while the others are also on staff, but their positions have not yet been defined, right? It's being decided now. The word position is such a strange one. So far, in the first project, in the first type of apparatus, there are several approaches to organizing. Activities, such as a matrix structure, and others. For our project activities, a matrix type of organization is suitable. It does not require a rigid organizational structure. The project team is still formed from one side and on the other side. To obtain licenses, certificates, and other necessary documents, we must follow the classic structure and appoint positions, and so on. This entire work will also be formed necessarily, because in order to fly officially, specialists from Rosaviatsia and other organizations need to come here and, roughly speaking, validate our activities. And indeed, the entire organizational structure will naturally be created for this purpose. And now, it turns out that everyone who comes says, I have amazing specialists. They are geniuses in their field, which means that some people have to be lured away from other companies, because they are, of course, already working somewhere. Well, we will do this, and I am glad that people are coming, with great enthusiasm, because after all, it's not just money that matters. Although, of course, everyone will receive their salary, as it cannot be otherwise. But at the same time, the idea of building a dirigible and creating such a company really inspires many people. It's great. Yes, many. Very many. In fact, there is a very high volume of calls coming from various sides, both from institutions and from institutions. Analytical agencies are calling saying, hey guys, we will guide you on which direction to go. Thank you very much. It's as if it's not clear. But the interest, yes, it's alive. It's a good interest. And that's really cool. In general, Solar Group knows how to, let's say, in a manner of speaking, have a good vision, as they say nowadays, right? If you will. In the sense that we seem to feel these trends, Somehow, because, well, it seemed like we were just living our lives, and then we decided to get involved with airships, and it turned out that we started working on them just in time. I don't know if I should mention names, but some specialists who were also invited to the new project had a real choice, as they were being invited to other government organizations at the same time to work on airships. I can't say, in short, I am actually being a bit reckless when I mention names, because until this matter is completely settled, on our end, even from a legal standpoint, it is risky. Well, that's why I said I wouldn't name names. But regarding what you showed, there is also a document indicating that the government has issued an order to develop the industry. Now everything. Well, they provided the document, by the way. There was a very lively discussion about what this document is and what it is for. Can you explain? Yes. 
The government wants to receive a proposal, not even for the development of the entire industry, but at least something in the range of 30 to 200 tons. Is there anything at all, they asked. This is the request from the government. If the government receives a proposal for the construction of a certain device in response to this request, it will consider this proposal. If the state receives a small program consisting of three devices to carry out specific tasks that exist within the state, it will consider this project. If it receives a comprehensive vision for the industry's development along with its commercial justification from someone, naturally it will say, wow, we didn't expect that. In general, the document is simply created to shake things up, to invigorate, and to explore what we can conditionally do. And a certain framework has been established to prevent ideas like, how about launching a platform on Venus for the development of the North, the Northern Sea Route, and other Arctic zones? As part of this task, she definitely expects a proposal indeed by the new year. So, is she ready to finance such project? Developing oneself in maritime routes is, in our country, even a matter of political sovereignty. There is technological sovereignty and there is political sovereignty. We definitely need to develop it. Naturally, we are ready. In fact, the government is ready for a lot of things. I'm going to get into trouble again. The government is ready to finance many, many things. There's just no one to give the money. Well, that's true. Because, as we found out, there are indeed many airship pilots in the country. We need to get organized. Yes. Organizing is also a great talent, to gather everyone together, and a lot of work has really been done over these months, even years, to bring all the people under one, let's say, brand, in one team, in one company, in one office. Overall, it's not a trivial task, so to speak. Well, just three years ago it was impossible. They couldn't even meet or talk to each other. It would just start with one side being tough and the other side being soft. On these engines, and on those, what about this one, and what about that one? In general, everyone had their own thoughts in this direction. Fortunately, they organized themselves. So what do you think, if, for example, the government is ready to give money to Nova, is it worth taking it now? Look, let's definitely move forward as we initially outlined at the very beginning of the logical chain, as we initially outlined. We will launch a large capital at the moment when our legal structure is currently ready for it, which is significant. That is, if someone knocks tomorrow and says, here is a large sum of money, from the government or from a corporation, we will not accept it. Ideally, this should be done after the demonstrator. To get the demonstrator in the air, we already know for sure that, by taking on certain financial obligations, we will, firstly, fulfill them. And secondly, we are confident that our legal structure is stable and that nothing will happen to it, regardless of what happens with this project. We have demonstrated that we are indeed capable, which means we are able to carry it out, and we had sufficiently enough time to do everything safely. I'm not saying that I actually fear Russia. Everyone understands everything absolutely perfectly. Well, yes, and it's worth mentioning again as we have already discussed. So, if we go in this direction, it will still be a separate company, a specific project, or a particular apparatus, and it could be, for example, a subsidiary of NOVA that will take this money from the state, and to the point that there will be no dilution of shares here, even if there is some large capital or grant, it will be done within the framework of a separate company. Accordingly, it is also beneficial for investors if NOVA now has a subsidiary that, for instance, the state has given a billion rubles and said, please build us a dirigible. Here, you also know that the new company does not receive money from the bear state. In fact, everything depends on the team, on how well they work together, how cohesive they are, and how effectively they implement any technical solutions. Indeed, everything else can be negotiated. Whether it's a subsidiary or not, whether they will give it in zero or not, that's all later. For sure. In general, such options exist. The state, so to speak, would like to. The question is whether anyone besides us will be able to, more precisely, probably definitely. Yes.
The crowd is undoubtedly the driving force of this project. Everyone absolutely understands this perfectly. Any government money takes a long time, and sometimes it can indeed even be expensive. Yes, and coordinating some program is just bureaucratically complicated. And I mean that even if we open this opportunity after the demonstrator, it may take another year or even more just for one approval. While there, it will obviously be a device for a specific task, and this specific task will have a number of co-executors, beneficiaries, and so on. And while this whole machine is getting sorted out, we might already be lifting the next more serious device into the air. So, well, we'll just see how it goes. A little bit more, I guess. Is there anything else that can perhaps be shared about what happened? Yes, everything is possible. Is there perhaps an idea about advertising on a dirigible? No. In short, I really don't want to make a dirigible like everyone else does. Selling a dirigible to one company that then puts Goodyear or something similar on it. It's like, you know, it's just not nice. You know, yes, there is an idea on how to make it cool. In general, in previous projects, and in many projects, I periodically create something like an honor board, where the names of all participants and investors are written, or an honorary ceiling like Skyway. There is an idea to create the first airship pixel by pixel, even if we don't go into details. There is an option using advertising, let's say, but as you mentioned, not tacky advertising. Yes, hypothetically, even by the first device. Yes, there is an idea to not place some large inscription, but to do it a bit differently. We will probably explain later how it might look. Yes, the most basic idea for commercializing a dirigible is to sell advertising on it, such as banners. It is for everyone. That is, it is not tourism, not cargo transportation, just selling advertising on it. But selling a menstrual airship just to use it for advertising is so stupid. It's clear how it can be an addition. A tool for earning money, okay? And here is the idea. To buy this entire demonstrator through the same story. So, in fact, we have our first device. Not that it has started performing its direct function of delivering cargo for the customer yet, but it is already bringing profit to the investors. So, could you tell me if the broadcast is actually happening or not? Look, I have it on Vicontacto. Yes, because something is indeed happening, I see. I think that it definitely fell off a long time ago. Indeed, on YouTube. Well, forget about it. Just check it out on Vicontacto, then... So, is it on Vicontacto? Yes, indeed, absolutely. Everything is certainly fine. Well, that's wonderful. The broadcast is on Pate. It's being written on Vicontacte over here. Pavel Akhmedov is asking. There will be an internal combustion engine or a turbine to spin the generator while the propellers will be driven by electric motors. Tell me, where did you place the bugs in the office? Make it unmanned right away. It will be easier to replicate immediately. I completely agree, definitely. It will be easier to replicate, but optionally piloted, which is important in many areas. That is, sometimes a pilot is really needed. It's clear that an unmanned vehicle can go and perform the task. But sometimes the responsibility is so great that it's generally better to have a pilot. Tush, it's fine on YouTube, but you seem to have some kind of injury. I'm just actually attempting to really examine this, but let me just take another look. Well, let's really move on to the question since you already started. While you begin answering, I'll just take a look, just in case. Yes, I sent. A short video about how we recently sat down to discuss the technological processes there and about... The localization of production for these fabric film materials was generally discussed in detail, focusing on how to organize everything here in a systematic manner. Along the way, it naturally leads to the welding of these materials, and there are already significant developments and advanced technologies for both processes. 
this is now about a commercially viable serial production. So we will be setting up the necessary equipment and infrastructure. Additionally, we will be considering the integration of new methodologies and practices to enhance the overall efficiency and effectiveness of the production process. He probably doesn't even need to be bought because Ruslan just has perfect skills in manufacturing and creating equipment from scratch. There is already a mechanical production facility where all of this can be done, and right now this is one of the main tasks. We are integrating our existing production capabilities, both intellectual and the actual production capacities, with the designers so that everything we can do ourselves, we will do ourselves. This is naturally logical and our extensive resources and capabilities. And everything that will be done somewhere on the side, in broad cooperation, so that we have access to these technologies for, conditionally, its further localization. The question of further localization is not urgent, of course, but it is definitely important to keep this in mind. Even in the contracts we conclude with contractors, subcontractors, and so on. Please state Ruslan's last name, as it is unclear. Arslan of Ruslan. He didn't perform very well at the big conference. Sergei Semenov introduced him. He seemed to stand up, waved his hand, and I talked a little about him, so... Arslan of Ruslan. This is a person who has been involved in modernizing combines since childhood, significantly increasing their productivity. He developed machines independently. They assembled both laser and erosion machines, as well as milling machines. In general, I was placing orders for machines, then I started developing conveyor lines, producing them myself, and selling them in series. Displaced Japanese and American manufacturers in our Russian market, specifically in these conveyor lines and processing, especially in these areas. Again, I have to open my mouth when I shouldn't. In short, I also fulfilled some orders for the defense industry. I won't say which ones. The rotary engine that they created is currently still spinning and functioning. It is an aviation rotary engine, spinning on the stand at the State Aviation Engine Institute. He performed part of this work there. They designed and manufactured it, but it has not been fully produced yet. They completed the design of the remaining parts of the engine, tested all these components, and confirmed that everything works. This is the rotary engine, and it has already been handed over there. They took it apart, returned the parts. It has been reassembled at the State Aviation Engine Institute and is being tested. Oh, cool, it works. Ruslan has already modernized them further and said, I already have some ready. It's clear that it's, well, how should I put it, makeshift. In that regard, for an aviation engine to be officially recognized as an aviation engine and certified, it is necessary to carry out a huge bureaucratic procedure in parallel with the creation of the engine itself. But the fact that Ruslan accomplished this is really impressive. Firstly, he was involved in a number of productions, not just tinkering with metal parts, but the aviation theme is his favorite. They built small helicopters, by the way, I can share. That in the general chat. When the guys finished making the rotary engine for Ruslan Aslanov, they had a bit of free time. And during that time, they built some one- or two-seat helicopters, already in the fifth modification, and they fly on them themselves. Briefly about their capabilities. Yes, I can post a video if Ruslan approves or I think he will approve. They are asking whether they can ask technical questions here or in private messages. Please ask here. I will answer as much as I can. If I absolutely definitely can't do it, we'll call next Friday. We will answer the question addressed to the designers or technologists. I'm waiting for feedback on the ideas. Yes, on the ideas. Guys, sorry, 
There are just so many ideas. I need to sort them all out. And we definitely need to choose a winner. We just haven't fully settled in here during the first week, as you can see, so we don't have a winner yet. Why bring him here? Everything is not ready yet, and there is the opportunity to finish the ideas, because there is inertia with videos. They are watched both online and a week later, and even two weeks later. The feedback will come very soon. Let's say I will definitely commit to reading absolutely everything this weekend. They are meticulously compiling it into one comprehensive document, and it is already quite large and extensive. As for the technical questions, there are detailed plans for effectively combating icing on the airship. There are several innovative technical solutions. One particularly interesting solution involves weaving a special unique thread into the fabric. By the way, this special thread is considered a revolutionary, almost groundbreaking discovery in the country. I don't remember the exact name of the company that makes it, but the thread is made with high quality carbon fiber, and they use it for everything from durable awnings to sturdy houses, so you can apply voltage more accurately and efficiently. And the snow melted. There is a solution for weaving such threads into the overall shell, and there, with minimal consumption, the shell will be heated. Warm air from the same engines and generators can also be directed there in parallel, in order to efficiently and effectively reach the desired location. It is essential to have a hydrophobic coating that will prevent any accumulation in the water. Additionally, the existing technology for airplanes involves treating the fuselage with a special compound. Most likely the solution will be a combined one. Either 1 plus 2 or 2 plus 3 or all 1, 2, 3. It will all depend on the task and the device where it is used. Clearly they are not needed for Africa, although if they are high altitude then they are necessary. In general, each device will have its own zone, function, where it is applied, where it operates, and the conditions will be different everywhere. Specific types will be selected for each particular condition. In some cases, it will be sufficient to warm up, while in others, the heat from the engines will be enough. It is clear that he has a huge surface area, and this convection will draw all the heat from it. But there will be enough of the onboard heat generated locally by the accompanying components, with units, engines, generators, and so on. In some cases, it will not be enough, and we will have to additionally create systems including magnetron heating of gas inside bags and make plasma torches. Why not? It is a sufficiently effective solution. What gas is in the shell? Helium. In the future, in unmanned versions, in the stratosphere, hydrogen. There is no danger that it will mix with oxygen because there is no oxygen and it will explode but mainly helium, helium, and once again helium. Let's start with the volume of the shell. Is there any data? The first device is 2200 cubic units, but there is a delta for its stretching and other factors. In cubes, Pavel suggests that the company Ampertex makes such heating devices. That's what I mean. Someone suggests a website, the triple task, for a stratospherist is to choose their idea. I'll take a look at the idea. Just tell me to which email you sent the idea. So, look, I found some questions on YouTube for now. Yes, by the way, friends, it seems that the broadcast on our main channel has irretrievably dropped. But the broadcast is going on the Solar Group channel, so I will read the questions from here. Unfortunately, I no longer see those questions. In good news, despite the fact that one of our broadcasts dropped out today, we still have a record attendance for our webinars. Thank you very much for that. I see that in any case the audience has slightly shifted to other platforms. It's great, great that with each webinar I can practically say, record, record, record.
We have more and more viewers at each webinar, but this indicates that we are doing everything right. The project is becoming more and more interesting. I think people are just starting to understand more about what is happening and are watching with interest. So, well, let's move on to the questions. You say there's nowhere to actually spend money on airships. I don't really know where we said that. Suvelmas, Tiazhoristov, and Ulobov enter production outside of Russia. They say there is no demand. Oh, there is no demand. Maybe it means, I don't know, maybe it means that they are moving production to China. It's unclear, provocative, illogical. I don't even know. It's not a question. It's a half statement, just with a question mark. Yes. So tell me, will you be attracting 2.5 million or 1 million dollars at the pre-start? When will the first stage be, well, for now? We are talking about a million dollars, keeping that in mind. If anything definitely changes now, we will inform you what may change here. In principle, we talked about this today, that at this moment the technical specifications are being clarified, all estimates are being worked out in more detail, and based on this, it will be possible to understand how much funding is needed to complete the initial work. Then we will be able to adjust all these amounts. Well, after that, everything will be clear because the first stage will already be in place. The pre-launch will take place and we won't have any significant changes. What problems exist in construction and operation? No problem. These are all tasks, mainly organizational and technical. Licensing and certification can definitely be identified as a problem. But it is not really an issue. Everything has been done and will continue to be done. You know, as a person who definitely loves to invent things with my own hands, I have a question. I can assemble some kind of device. For example, an engine. It will work, but the task itself is to create a bunch of paperwork for it. I don't even make drawings. I mainly print 3D models. I will make 3D models, send them, and if someone can ask over the phone before landing, I pray to make the drawing and mark everything. It is flat from different angles and sides. I really like it. And well, obviously, there are specially trained people for this. Certification and licensing, on the other hand, is quite a cumbersome procedure. But this, again, is not a problem. It is an organizational task that needs to be solved. From a production standpoint, I believe there are absolutely no problems. From a design perspective, there are also absolutely no issues. Definitely. Again, there is an administrative and organizational problem just to agree on what the next type will be because even now, on Tuesday, we are saying the next one will be a 10-ton model, but it could be a 6-ton one. Right now, we are leaning towards 10, of course, but it might be 6. This is a problem because we have ordered a lot of analytical information regarding the transport markets and logistics branches, where everything flows, what part can be taken or not, and so on in general. Reports from analytical companies in general at the moment. Naturally, these reports will influence and somehow adjust what we are currently taking into consideration for the near future in the upcoming forms. The real problem, in fact, is getting people to agree to negotiate with government agencies in order to obtain a certificate for this device. The problem is to come to an agreement among themselves and with the business. For example, people create problems, while technology is just a solution. So, how many 2-ton vehicles and 10-ton vehicles are planned to be produced initially, and what is the projected profit from this? Let's refer to this demonstrator conditionally as a 2-ton vehicle, because if we load some of the equipment onto it, it can already carry a ton or more. We are at the zero stage, formulating the technical appearance and preparing the technical specifications for it. After the phase, 
there won't be any more current situations. The two-ton vehicle, and we can only take a maximum of one and a half. How many are planned to be made? Again, everything I am saying now may be adjusted later, but at this point in time, it is important to note that serial production will be capable of producing approximately 10 units per year in the future, and this is subject to change. It's indeed very easy, and we absolutely aim for something extremely bigger. Naturally, the serial production and commercial application of these vehicles is again related to the certification and approval of these units. However, the question comes up. Could the military help? In our country, the situation is such that if a military technical experiment is successful, all subsequent bureaucratic processes are quite expedited significantly. And if we help, for example, the same drones to protect some civil infrastructure object located here in the country, by simply equipping them with advanced video cameras or perhaps some sophisticated radars, then the official permission for their further use will be obtained much, much faster. Additionally, the process will be streamlined. Then, opportunities arise precisely because the impossibility opens a window for serial production and their sale. It is strategically planned to earn a significant margin on them. Of course, the profitability of the airship, as such, is conditionally infinite, considering the cartel agreement on how much it costs for 1,000 cubic meters. It is clear that our project is commercial and investment-oriented, and therefore, the profit should be definitely substantial. The question is whether the profit should be significant right from the first units, or if it should gradually increase over time. Let's take a look at the various factors that could influence this decision, yes and no. Should it be? In general, if this vehicle is going to be used for solving special tasks, I'm not talking about a special military operation. I mean, a special task is to tow a drilling rig. That is a special task. Delivering some specific details about the equipment to a northern geographical location is a special task. For the special task, conditionally, indeed, a lot is paid for it. If you want to break into the highly competitive logistics market, he will count every single penny for every kilometer. And very clearly, it won't be possible to inflate profitability to the moon. If these vehicles are sold to a business, then it becomes a secondary question of how they ultimately plan to make a profit in the market, such as they are already negotiating here. As long as it is still profitable for them to buy these vehicles, we can keep raising the price, raising it, and raising it conditionally. Yes, I think we will definitely roll out very detailed and comprehensive specific business plans for this vehicle by the new year very soon. Regarding the 10-ton vehicles, we only have a general overview. In a conditional manner, on a picture made up of three pixels, indicating that we will be able to produce them at a rate of approximately one per month, that their production cost will be lower than that of the MI-8, and that they can generally be sold at a higher price. Based on this, we calculated that the profit from these vehicles over a year amounts to over $300 million, as presented on Tuesday. Essentially, this means that the production and sale of these vehicles will be highly profitable. Is there a possibility to further reduce the cost price in what we have already discussed today at this point in time? Furthermore? Yes, reduce the cost price. Should we lower the profit? Dampen it. Ideally, on one hand, as it has always been in aviation, let's build one airship, sell it for the highest price, and everyone will earn a lot from it. But here it should be understood that one can create three airships and sell them for a very high price. You will suffocate the industry again. Mass production, yes you, will suffocate the industry again. And here it's like a bet, or just like Elon Musk. Well, he's really impressive, I often refer to him. Definitely. He took and bent the entire space industry to... Well, it all started with electric vehicles. 
which is actually not so straightforward. As for space, everything is definitely clear. The Russian truck Proton was the cheapest rocket we had. And then Elon Musk took and made launches so incredibly and remarkably cheap that just took over the entire market. At first, he had many attempts, some successful, some unsuccessful, and so on. It is clear that initially the business required investment, investment, investment. But now it is such a profitable and large company, and he has just started mass launches. He conducts a lot of launches, with these stages constantly operating, and one stage flies up to ten times. In other words, did this approach of lowering the price pay off? Yes, it did. Should we do the same? I believe we should. The person whose question we initially did not understand says, well, fine, we didn't understand the first question. Here is the second one. Please provide detailed information on what has been done on the project without any promises. Return all the way back to the very beginning of the story, where everything initially started and unfolded, and explore how it all began. Why say the same thing a second time? Listen. Look where we are. We are in the office of Nova, the company that builds airships. There's your answer. Yes, we did discuss all of this in detail at the beginning. People have been hired, and work has begun. The technical specifications for the first units have been formulated specifically for the stratospheric vehicles. The scientific program for the development of the stratosphere is practically completed for the first year. This means it is clear which direction to take. The formation of the technical specifications for the first type of airship has begun. The initiation and establishment of a comprehensive and detailed scientific program, which is specifically aimed at further development and progress in various fields, has officially commenced and is now underway. Analog communication systems are being assembled by hand, and digital communication systems are being assembled. Technologies are aligning with designers, and everyone also understands the possibilities. Cooperations are forming for the creation of the nearest vehicles, and contracts are being signed. Question about the 1000 Club. Are there any spots available? Yes, there are spots available. Friends, I remind you that today you have the opportunity to join the Solar Group Investors Club. To do this, you need to invest in the next generation airship project. The first 100 investors who actually invest $25,000 in this project will join the Club of 100. Well, those thousands of investors who are the first to invest $5,000 will enter the exclusive and prestigious Club of 1,000. Why be in the Club? There are various benefits and advantages for club members. The best investment conditions. The Club 100 also has a personal manager with whom you will work, who will always be in touch, addressing your questions, answering them, and so on. And a number of other privileges. You can familiarize yourself with all of this in your personal account or in the news. This is a club of the founders of the Solar Group projects, as these are the first major, so to speak, investors who are joining our projects. And thanks to them, these projects are getting their initial boost. That's why we have, let's say, a very special relationship with them, and the number of places is indeed limited, as you might have understood from the title. Here's a question I saw on YouTube. Recently, there was a video of a dirigible falling on houses. How would you comment on this accident? How can this incident be used in the PR for our project? I liked the comment made by Sergei Semenov in the Telegram chat. He said that at least they have something to fall back on. We don't even have a dirigible yet. How should we comment on this? When airships are used, no one gets hit, except for incompetent people, in any way, shape, or form, at all, whatsoever. Any equipment can be destroyed. The device was destroyed. The device resembled more of a blimp than a fully controlled airship. Very simple, in a very simple manner, without any automation systems, or any other automation systems, or anything else at all. The airships are made in a great hurry, without. Serious technical development will persist if they are significantly manufactured and integrated into homes. How to use this video, it's just cool. People will remember airships in their design and functionality.
But in reality, this demonstrates its safety. The pilot did not perish. No one was harmed. He smoothly and gently made the impact. By the way, here are the technical specifications of the fabrics that will be used to make the first soft airships. We watched, coordinated, and so on. We realized that we could replicate this video in the same country, crash into the same buildings, and it will just do this. And it won't break. The structure will possess sufficient strength to withstand the required forces. Additionally, we can perform the process again if needed. So there is perhaps an idea for PR, so to speak. About ramming another's airship through. Specifically, yes. Specifically based on this video. Well, you have no questions. Regarding the broadcast that dropped on the second channel, I think we will just restart it completely later, since it was uploaded as one file, so everything will be there. But I believe that those who were interested have switched to other channels. The only thing is that I can't check the questions there, so I am answering questions from the Solar Group channel and from the contact. Next, there is a series of questions about what gas is in the shell, what its volume is, and how much a cubic meter of helium costs. I understand that there will be a series of questions prepared later, like in an interrogation. In general, Google how much a cubic meter of helium costs. Google how much it will cost to fill the entire vehicle. This is considering that you will buy helium at a retail price, with a 1000% markup, and so on, and so forth. There are actually more options for purchasing the gel than just opening Google and checking how much it costs. Yes, the question has already been asked twice. Hello, where is Kirillin? He hasn't appeared in a while. Everything is fine with Alexander Nikolaevich. He is recovering his health. As the Grey Cardinal, I wanted to say in general about this. In the palace, it was actually planned that he would go a little further to take care of his health at the sanatorium. Everyone saw what happened. With his leg, Alexander Nikolaevich. In reality, he was running, jumping, and was energetic all this time, until the moment he had to move from one floor to another at MAI. Well, of course, students helped him carry tables, chairs, and other items. He took the most valuable documentation for himself. He took a lot, and something happened with his foot. At first it was okay, but then it got worse with his knee. There was already something going on with the knee, so in general, the ailment crept up. It's unclear, but I understand. Most likely the tendons just slipped, and then it pulled one, just like always. One thing, another. He started treatment with some academic, a doctor, another doctor. They did something there, it went well at the conference, but Kermick had difficulty moving. We recently visited him, and he is feeling very much better now. He is using a cane, so he is slowly recovering and will be back very soon. Fuck. Will military actions interfere? We have already mentioned this. Thus, the discussion is about communication standards. This is no longer a question. There is GSM 2G with a range of up to 70 kilometers from the base station. In general, it's about this connection and so on. Let's start filming the video. Maybe we can invite those guys next Friday. There's Dennis over there. There is a Dennis working on the analog side. There is a second Dennis who will be focusing on the digital side. It just so happens that we have two Denises both of whom are communication specialists. Let's talk in more detail if this is of interest. There won't be 2G used there. Something else will be used for approximately 200 kilometers. In direct visibility, this is one device, while another is even larger and further away. I'm not fully familiar with them yet. I'm more of a metal engineer. With a focus on structural integrity and design, the question from YouTube is whether your legendary Ruslan which has a storied history and reputation, will be fully engaged in production or if it will be subcontracted to other companies or entities. It seems to be written like that, with a clear intention to understand the production process. Ruslan is relieved of all his tasks, dedicates himself completely, 
and gathers his team, including those he has already dismissed, back exclusively for the supportive direction of localization, cost reduction, and serial production in order to. If the question is whether there will be any contractors, naturally, it is impossible to master everything all at once. It has to be done gradually. So, if the question is whether there will be more contractors, of course, there will be, and they will definitely localize everything. In fact, there is no real point in that. They will come eventually, and will continue to expand. But again, let's ask some questions, at least on a timeline, indicating some framework. That is, the question is posed within the framework of the first half of the year, the year, five years, ten years, in relation to one type of vehicle, all types of vehicles. We will eventually go there and to other countries, like building a dirigible in India or in Africa. Will Ruslan be there? Of course, someone to transfer the technology, organize, handle paperwork. Will there be a contractor? Of course, there will. Why can't a truly rigid vacuum airship actually be made in the real world, in reality, in the actual world? In summary, based on the fundamental principles and established laws of physics, which govern the behavior of matter and energy, this is the conclusion we can draw. Here is the question about the club. Is the price going to be 100,000? And will the price next stages be the same as pre-launch? So, no, there will be the first stage, meaning that even club members won't be able to take part in the pre-launch at the first stage because the pre-launch is not the stage where one can, so to speak, roll back. One can only be at the first. In the third stage, for example, strawberries will be able to take from the first, but not before the start, such as, so the investment conditions that you see today will never be available again, not even to the strawberries. Two emails are currently already appearing in the comments on vContact, already asking for a response. I hope our colleagues will take note of these important emails, but just in case, I sent my direct one. Please send it there directly and immediately. I am currently patenting a new type of airship, and I ask you to respond in private messages. I am responding here. Here is my email. Send me your ideas about airships and their applications in the stratosphere. There are tasks for drones, for example, in agriculture with a range of 10 to 100 kilograms. Will such solutions be available? They can be monetized quickly. The airship, which is a type of lighter-than-air aircraft, has a size specification below which its use is completely impractical, unless for some special tasks that require its unique capabilities. Here, 500 kilograms is the minimum below which it is not even worth listening to those people who say that we will now build a state, and there will be 500 kilograms, and it will somehow be commercially viable. Although in Africa they launched a small device that can carry up to approximately 10 kilograms of medication, and they received an order for this device to fly between cities. In fact, let's look at the distances. It's clear that getting an order for a dirigible to transport medical supplies in Africa, wow, that's a lot of money. They will work for a year. Let's see if it's a profitable company or a loss-making one. In the case of agriculture, it is a well-developed, large market. And there are already stricter requirements than, for example, carrying out a special task in some part of Africa. There is still a certain size classification below which it is definitely not worth going. I think there will be a task for the 500 kilogram vehicle in agriculture to make it economically beneficial. Well, the questions on vContact have run out, in my opinion. On YouTube as well, at least on the Solar Group channel. As I mentioned, most questions are definitely about the Duino engines, but whether we have currently restored the broadcast there or not. I am currently watching the broadcast myself, and it makes me so sad to look at myself. My arms are thin, and I don't have time to go to the gym. Yeah, you know, by the way, as I look at the picture, it feels like it's on a green background, right? It looks like the office has been slightly overlaid because it's a bit blurry behind us, but no, the office is definitely real. Do you want me to walk over there to make it clear that there is no green background? Yes, indeed, a truly real office. Here, the lawyers will be sitting here, 
There is actually a lot of legal work involved in this process. I made it to the end of the journey. Here are the accountants of the new company, who will handle all the financial matters. Look, the flower is already there. So, the office is real. Some kind of top unexpected ending to the webinar. Fyodor just got up and walked into the background. But it turned out not to be a background. Into the wall. Yes, since there are no more questions, actually. That's it. We can wrap up. Yes. In fact, we will aim to conduct our webinars for no more than one and a half hours. I think this is the optimal time. Yes, 30-40 minutes for the news, 30-40 minutes to answer questions. More than that, that's enough. Let's see how we manage to do this. I want to sincerely thank you once again for the record attendance at our broadcast and deeply appreciate your support and commitment. We are glad that you are becoming more and more familiar with the project and that you find it interesting to follow. We will try not to miss any more broadcasts now that we have an office. It's easier to pop into the next room. And yes, because there is really a lot of actual work, it is currently difficult to prepare for the Friday webinars, to come up with some super topics, and to sit and think about what we will be discussing or presenting. Our content department, represented by Alexei Romanov, is already hitting us with sticks, saying he needs a plan, he needs guests. What are you doing? We all understand this perfectly, and we will organize all this work, of course, as soon as this rush is structured. In the meantime, please feel free to suggest topics you would like to discuss next Friday. It will be more about the airship and more, which we plan to build, or if there are any technical specifications, this is more about organizational issues, or more about the stratosphere, the communication system, or if you want to see someone specific, Write in the Telegram chat with some hashtag like Webinar Friday or just Friday. Any hashtag will do. For now, since there are no hashtags, I think a common one will spontaneously come up. Yes, or you can also write directly in the vContact broadcast. You can write anywhere. We review all of it. I definitely check it out. And if there are any great ideas, I will forward them to you, Fedor. So don't forget to like. Don't forget to repost. And don't forget to share this broadcast with your friends. It will be available in the recording at the same link. Together with you, this project will definitely move forward. And where are the beautiful posters and the beautiful secretaries? Well, there will be posters. Whoever we do it for, we will do it. Of course, there will be a stylistic design for the office. Yes, we specifically sat down today, almost in the hallway of the office, to show you that it exists. Most likely, we will be allocated a special room to do all of this. Passenger transportation can be conducted between cities. For example, this question has also arisen. In fact, it is possible and necessary. There is a question specifically about the flight frequency. That is, how the old airship will differ from the new one. Or rather, how the new one will differ from the old. In the past, airships were heavily dependent on weather conditions. And it was impossible, you know, to buy a ticket, for example, from one city to another to ensure that the airship would arrive there at 3 dollars p.m. on a specific date. And so, the modern airship will have to provide this capability in order to effectively and efficiently operate in various scenarios and situations. The only limitation that the situation imposes on the use of airships in such flight operations is their dependence on weather conditions and weather patterns. But weather dependence is such a relic from the past. I believe modern airships will handle it. So yes, Anything is possible. And on this positive note, that everything is possible and there are no more questions. Yes, good luck to us all. <laughs>